Shalom, shalom. Good evening, everyone. This is uh, Reverend Dr. Noba Trakiro. I'm coming here on behalf of uh, uh, my wonderful, wonderful friend, uh, Pastor Carol Karyuki. Uh, she's, uh, she has been very gracious. Uh, her along together with LFM Nairobi Church have been very gracious to put together this wonderful opportunity for us to be blessed, to be blessed together in the body of Christ. Uh, this evening, I am so, so excited with what the Lord has in store for us. Uh, the right protocol being followed. Uh, I acknowledge the leadership of uh, LFM Nairobi Church, the Mother Church in Nyeri, all the saints that are watching, the leadership that serve with uh, Pastor Carol, and of course, not forgetting her wonderful husband. Uh, God bless you all. I salute you from the depths of my heart. Saints, this evening, as uh, you had seen in the poster, uh, we are going to delve, or uh, start delving into a certain series, a certain series on raised to take over. Raised to take over. I will give you a minute or two um, just uh, start your watch parties, uh, invite a few of your friends. Let's make sure that we, we are generous with the truth and the opportunity for us to be blessed together. God has never been a selfish God. He has been a giving God. He has been a loving God. It is part of his nature and part of his character. So you know that God has prepared something wonderful for us this evening. Uh, if you need to quickly message your friend and tell them, hey, uh, make sure you're logged on because God has something fantastic for us this evening. Uh, just make sure that you do that. If you want to share the, the video stream, this is a wonderful time to do it. This is a wonderful time to do it and the Lord will bless you tremendously. The Lord will bless you greatly. Uh, everyone... Uh, I'd like to call our attention to scripture this evening. And um, I want us to start from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to verse 28. As we set the background of where we need to go. Remember, we are teaching, and I will be speaking specifically on the topic, raised to take over. Raised to take over. So Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 through to 28 scripture says and god said let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the fowl of the air over the cattle and over all all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth so god created man in his own image in the image of God created he him, male and female. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth on the surface of the earth. Let's also take a, a second reading uh, from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. This is a portion of scripture that you are very well aware of. This is the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. He says, for unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord will perform this. Let's take our last reading in the book, or still in the book of the prophet Isaiah, and uh, chapter 2, I'll take uh, verse 2 and 3. It says, And it came to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of 
the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow unto it. All the nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up into the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. May the Lord bless us this evening as we get started. I pray that wherever you are, the wonderful family of LFM Nairobi Church, the brethren and saints across the globe, this evening, this afternoon, whatever time zone you're in, I pray that God may release a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ Jesus, so that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. I pray that he will release grace, he will release power, so that not only do you understand, but you are moved from where you are to where you ought to be. In Jesus' name, say amen wherever you are. Glory to Jesus. So I want to start talking to you this evening uh, by taking you to the foundation, the original plan of God. When we read in Genesis, we see that God had a plan. He had an intention. He created man. He said, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. There is a way that God intended for man to function. There is a way that God intended for man to operate. Remember, heaven was already in place. And when he began with creation, when he was done with the rest of the environment, he said, let us now make man in our own image. The land was not made in his image. The sea was not made in his image. The atmosphere was not made in his image. The firmament, however beautiful it is, the stars at night, the kaleidoscope you look at, all that was not made in his image. It is at the point of creating man that he said, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness and let him have dominion. Let me tell you, the children of God are supposed to be like their father. It is a case of like father, like son, like father, like daughter. Interestingly, once he created Adam and he put him in the Garden of Eden, he brought forth, he looked at the environment, said it is not good for man to be alone. Let us make him a helpmate and Eve comes into the picture. So we have Adam and Eve in a perfect environment. Adam and Eve experienced two types of environments. The Garden of Eden, which was perfect, one of dominion, but then upon being deceived and assigning themselves to a level lower than God had ordained for them, leaving the dominion mandate and authority and grace that God had given them, they opted for something lower because they negotiated what God had said. They entered into a discussion about what God had thus said the Lord, what God had decreed from his mouth. A rema had come and a man and his wife entered into negotiation and they were degraded into an environment where they lacked dominion. The rest of mankind coming from that day onwards, you know that we were born into a dominionless context. By default, we never had to choose whether we had dominion or not. Every baby that is born finds themselves without dominion. They don't have an option. Therefore, the plan changed. There was a shift. Once Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden, there was a shift in terms of operations. We see as we go through the Old Testament, we see that God raises certain men. He speaks to them and addresses them. After a while, he comes to uh, Abraham, who was called Abram. And Abram had come from out of the Chaldeans with his father Terah. They came and camped somewhere. God spoke to him and said, uh, come, depart from your family, depart from your kindred. Come to a land that I will show you. I will give you something. The man believed God, started walking, and scripture says it was accounted to him for righteousness. You may be saying, man of God, why are you taking us through this? Please indulge me. Allow me to refresh your memory. Why we need to go where we need to go over this season. Amen. So 
Abraham starts walking with God, it is attributed to him for righteousness. We find his son Isaac. Jacob comes into the picture. We know the story of Joseph and his brothers and how by divine providence, he was moved from the wilderness, in, from the land of Canaan into Egypt because there was a need to preserve the people. We get into that place, 400 years later, we have an entire generation who their great-grandfathers were born in captivity. Generations who had never seen liberty. So it moved from just lacking dominion, a negative state, to an active state of oppression. I don't know where you are in the continuum today, wherever you're listening to me. You may be looking okay, you may be going to church, but each and every one of us are in a different state in the continuum. From having just lost dominion, to the point when we are in total captivity. And God has a way out for each and every one of us. I wish somebody would say amen wherever they are. So we find that after this captivity, God brings them out, puts them under schoolmaster for a number of years to highlight man's fallen state. And then by the time we get to Isaiah chapter 6, uh, chapter 9, we find the prophecy talking about Jesus coming. The prophets have come before. There are few prophets who come after him. But God and Isaiah, under the inspiration of God, prophesies and says, For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. This is an amazing thing. The prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. The first very, very concrete prophecy that expounds about his mandate describes what will be upon the shoulder of this son who is given. While a child is born and a child needs to be taken care of, a child needs to be protected, that's why Mary and Joseph had to find a manger to take care of him. And many, many people still think he's a baby in a manger. No, no, no. The baby was the packaging of the son who was given. And that son came with government on his shoulder. He was carrying dominion, the mandate that had been lost in the Garden of Eden. When Christ came, born of a woman, born of a virgin, under the unction of the Spirit of God, the thing that was clearly upon him, the one thing that is defined prophetically that he was bringing was government. So I want you to listen to me very keenly as we go into this. Remember, this was the first clear sign that restoration of government was the primary business of the Lord Jesus when he came into the earth. Restoration of government was the primary business that the Messiah had. The rest of it were processes and effects of the restoration of dominion, of the government and the mandate to reign on this earth. The scripture says, as he is in heaven, so are we in this earth. I wish you'd hear what I'm saying this evening. Remember, therefore, as we are all born into a state of fallenness, we must realize that Jesus came, made sure he restored government, but the default state of every man is a fallen state. Therefore, the entry and walking into the restored dominion, the restored government, has to be a personal choice. Every single one of us. I remember my own experience. I remember 1993, November 19th, at 11.24 a.m., when I got brought back into the kingdom of God, when the Lord rescued me from a lost way. Everybody who is in the kingdom has an encounter, has a time when they made the quality decision. And I don't know who you are this evening, sir, ma'am, Listen to me, we are coming to you with a word from the Lord today. From LFM Nairobi Church, we are telling you, friends, you need to give your life to Jesus. It doesn't matter where you are. You have seen the day and age we are living in. There is no one who enters the kingdom by inheriting it from their parents. You may be the well, most well-behaved young man, young woman. You may be the most civil madam. You may be an excellent lady, an excellent man. You may be responsible, but that is not the same as entering the kingdom of God. 
Everybody has to enter it by choice. No one enters it by association. No one gets their dominion mandate back by osmosis, by hanging around the right people. You have to make a decision. And I pray this evening that as you listen to me, you will make the quality decision to regain and take back your dominion mandate that Christ has made available for you. Oh, it is a wonderful thing to think about. But let's continue with the context and the background that I'm setting today. Everybody, therefore, must make a personal decision. Everybody must make a personal decision to enter the kingdom. But those who have entered the kingdom, remember scripture says that to the increase of his kingdom. This is in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. Talking about the Lord and the mountain of the, the Lord shall be exalted above all the other mountains and above all the other hills and the nations shall flow unto it. It goes on to say that unto the increase of his kingdom there shall be no end. There shall be no end. There shall be no end. We are called to participate in the expansion of the kingdom of God. We are called to be able to be partakers in the extending of the kingdom of God. You may be there and you're still wondering, how does this tie together with being raised to take over? I'm so glad you asked this evening. So let's begin by laying part of the foundation of what we are handling today. Why should you want to take over? You may be there and you're already born again. You love the Lord. You are going to church. You, you are a partner in your ministry. You are faithful. You are serving in various departments, in various entities. You are reliable. You are part of the choir. You are with the intercessory team. Isn't this enough? Friends, this is not enough. I want to stir up your spirit. I want to stir up your heart today. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in the kingdom. I want to stir your heart up that there is more than just being a good church member. There is more than just being born again and avoiding sin. There is more than just avoiding hellfire. Listen, hell was never created for man. Hell was never created for the believer. Avoiding a place that was not meant for you is not really an achievement. Oh, let me, let me emphasize, let me repeat this. Because many of us have reduced the kingdom of God to a fire escape mechanism where we are afraid that if we don't come into the kingdom, if we don't worship God, then we may be cast to hell. That is how babies think. That is how the immature think. That is how those who have not been trained, those who have not been skillful in the word of God, in the understanding of the mysteries, that is is how they think. You may have come in because God gave you a revelation of your destiny as a sinner, that you would wind up in the fiery flames of eternal damnation. That could have caught your attention and you came in. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. No one comes unto the Father but through me. So you came unto Jesus and you have now come into the kingdom. Remember, there is more in the kingdom than a fire escape. It's an entire government. It's an entire life. He said when he was going back, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. So there are, there are mansions to be obtained. obtained. If you look back in scripture, he says that there is a crown for the wise who win souls. There are crowns of righteousness. When you look at uh, scripture in Revelation, it talks about us worshipping before the great throne, before the king of kings, and casting our crowns down. You have to have under crown to be able to cast a crown down. There is worship. There are crowns. There are rewards. There is pleasure evermore. But even before we go there, there is a mandate for which we have been called of God. Listen to Jesus praying towards the last uh, chapters of the book of uh, the gospel of John. He says, Father, I pray that you don't take them out of this world, but rather you preserve them from the wicked one. Jesus wanted us to be in this world before he captures us in the rapture and takes us before uh, the, the heavenly throne, the Father, and so that we are rewarded for our works and the things we have done. Before that, he said, do not take them out of this world. 
rather preserve them from the evil one. So why do we need to remain on this earth when we have been born again? When it is clear that hell is no longer an issue, the flames, the fiery furnaces that are meant for the devil are not meant for us. And having been restored to the dominion mandate, that ceases to be an issue. It ceases to be an agenda on why we live. We therefore don't live with the fear of sin. We don't live with the fear of damnation. We don't live with the fear of hell. In Instead, we live with a cry in our spirit saying, Abba, Father. Our cry is that we may please him who gave his life for us. Our cry instead is that we may be found faithful in him. Is that when we come before him, we may hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done, not well thought, not well said, not well planned, not well imagined, but rather we want to hear, well done, turn to your neighbor wherever you are in your house. Remember, we are having church today. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, you need to hear, well done. Not well thought, not well intended, not well planned, not well prayed. Praying is good, but after your prayer, you must get up. I usually say that the part of the unction is between receiving the direction of God and getting to the place of praying. That is where you need the unction. And when you have prayed, believing you have received, say amen. Between your amen and your there it is, there is time for action. After the unction, you need action. After the unction, you must have action. God says the man will be blessed in all that he does. Not all that he thinks, all that he does. Faith without acts, faith without action, faith without execution is an illusion, my friend. My brother, my sister, do you love the Lord? Do you love your master? Do you love the king? Do you love the body of believers? Then your faith must be translated into something that you do. You cannot say that you love the brethren, but you will not encourage them in fellowship. Just because we are online is not an excuse for you to miss fellowship. We are having church right now in the technology age. If it was a Tuesday evening service, I believe that you would have marched down into the sanctuary. The David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. For those who don't know and are outside the country, listen to the Kenyan version. There is a song, brethren, that I used to sing way back when I was in the university, 25 years ago. They used to say, Nili furai waliponambia that means I was overjoyed, I was excited when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So when you love the brethren, you don't just wish them well. Just like Isaiah say, if there is a hungry person, don't tell them, go and the Lord bless you. You feed them. If there is one who is naked, you clothe them. Therefore, there is action that is required. He said, what is a true fast? Not that just that you go hungry, but that you lose the bones of the captive. It's that you feed the hungry. It's that you protect the, the orphans and the widows, the fatherless. It's that you become a solution to the needs of the people that you find yourself in connection to. Those that you associate with. Those that can touch you and you can touch. That is what a real fast is, my friends. And I want to tell you, as a people who God has called to take over, we must make a resolve this evening, this afternoon, this morning, whatever time zone it is, whatever period it is you are listening to this broadcast, you must decide, I am going beyond theory. I am going into execution. I am going beyond planning. I am going beyond just the intercession. But once I say a man in the room of prayer, I'm coming out to be counted. I'm coming out to be counted. I must be a man. I must be a woman that the church can rely on, that the king can rely on. I must be a voice
voice in my generation that declares the voice, the word of the Lord, so that the angels may hearken and execute that which the king has decreed, that which the Lord has declared, that which the Lord has purposed for our day and our time. My God, I'm getting excited already. I don't know about you, but I am so blessed just by this. Why should you want to take over? Oh, there are several reasons. In addition to what I have told you, let me give you five. Let me take you through five because we must learn that scripture says, and it shall be line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. We build the church into maturity by systematically instructing the believers so that they may be able to rise from where they are to the place where they need to go. So that they may be able to mature from children to become sons who can go and answer the enemy at the gate. So that they may be the kind of men and women who the scripture says, blessed is he whose quiver is full of them. Not full of babies, but full of sons, full of mature people, full of them who have understanding in their own right. I wish you are listening to me this evening. Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory to God. Listen, the first thing, why you need, why you should want to take over. So I want to provoke you. You may, you may have lived and reached a point where you thought, hey, I'm okay. You need to want to take over. The first reason is that you are designed to be in a place of dominion, not a place of captivity, not a place of servitude, not a place of being dominated. Every human being is wired inside of them to gravitate towards the place of liberty, towards the place of actualization, towards the place of dignity, towards the place of freedom. That is why when you find someone that is limited by either poverty, by sickness and disease, the first thing you do instinctively is to have pity on them. You don't esteem them. You don't look at them as someone to emulate. The natural instinct is to have pity on them. The emotion of feeling sorry. The emotion of feeling, oh dear, this is someone who is deprived of something. This is someone who is not experiencing the abundant life. This is someone who is not experiencing the liberty for in him, him whom the Christ, the, the Lord said free, is free indeed. This is someone who has been overcome by limitations, overcome by circumstances, overcome by fear, overcome by disease, overcome by rejection, overcome by all kinds of natural circumstances. Every man, every woman, whether they are religious or not, whether they are educated or not, whether they are rich or not, there is a cry in them that they would walk in dignity, they would walk in honor, that they may not be considered to be an item of charity. God has put that in man because we were never designed to operate in a fallen state. We were not wired to be able to groven perpetually through life, always wondering what could have been, what should have been. We are not meant to go through life with dreams that never come out into fruition. We are never designed to be they who in their old age are talking about the dreams they had when they were children and in, their day, in the days of their youth, and yet they have not even begun to actualize them. Let it be that you are like terror, where you started the journey but you didn't finish and Abraham picks up. Don't be one who never began. Don't be one who never started. The reason why you should want to take over is because you were designed to be in a place of dominion. Number two, you were born into the right time and season. Nobody is here at the wrong time. Oh, listen to me. I'm not talking about the circumstances of your birth. You may even be a product of sexual violence. Your mother may have been assaulted. You may have been a product of a wartime and insta uh, instable, uh, instability in a country. Conflict. You lost both parents and therefore you grew up not knowing a father who would give you direction and identity or a mother who would love you. You may be among those who have grown up in the urban jungle that Nairobi is. 
that London is, that New York is, that most of the world cities are, and you find that you lived rough and you've had to fend for yourself. Listen to me. It doesn't matter the circumstances of your birth. The truth of the matter is that you came at the appointed time. And God could not have declared this an appointed time and allowed you to have been born if he had not yet prepared everything to turn your life around. God is a God of plan. He's a God of purpose. He's a God of objectivity. He's a strategic God. He is not a God who would send a man or woman who he has ordained for victory and then allow him to stay in circumstances that are unconquerable, that are insurmountable, that the, the battle that has been set against this individual can never be changed. That is untrue of our God. The nature of our God is that it doesn't matter how humble the beginnings are. God will ordain a path for you. He will bring a man or woman who will speak a word in season and light up the candle that is you and bring a word that will turn you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. He will bring a woman or a man of God who will teach you and ground you so that the laying hold of the the truth shall cause you to rise above the circumstances, shall cause you to experience that which God has called you to be. He will cause the real you to arise. He says, arise, O sleeper, and arise, O sleeper. Listen, even in Isaiah, it says, arise, and God shall shine upon you. There is a call to arise. This means that the one who is being called to arise must have been in a prone, in a reduced place. The circumstances of your birth do not change the rightness of your season. If you think that you could have been born in another time, the devil is a liar. The enemy is cheating you. It means that he wants to distract your life. He wants to distract your today by you pining over yesterday or wishing for a tomorrow. Tomorrow is in the future. Yesterday is already gone. God can only deal with you in now. The Bible says now faith is. Not yesterday faith was or tomorrow faith will be. It says now faith is. The Bible says now is the acceptable time of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Every time that you will experience life, it will be now. If you will ever experience victory, it will be now. And at that moment, whether the moment is today or it is tomorrow, at the point you are experiencing it, it will be now. So realize that God has ordained you for a now that is glorious. Your now is supposed to be glorious. He says, you will arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her. Yea, the set time has come. God declares and agrees with himself by saying, yea, the set time has come. This is the right time. This is the right time. Stop planning perpetually for the future and always living in a time that is going to come. Stop living in the past and wondering how life could have been if this hadn't happened to you, if only you had this opportunity, if only you, this person was there for you, if only these people didn't abandon you, if only so and so had remembered you, if only you had studied harder and passed the exams. Listen, yesterday is gone. God has an opportunity for you today. God has an opportunity to transform your life again today. You are alive at the right time. Don't pine about things that are not. Listen, you must be willing to settle in your heart that God is able to make all things abound to you for life and godliness in the life that you have, in the day that you're living. Once you remove your life, your eye, from always procrastinating into the future or pining and whining and complaining about the past, you will be ready to live the life that God has and he will give you the door and the opportunity for you to take over. I wish someone would be hearing what I'm saying this evening. Number three, what you need and what you needed to successfully reign on earth has already been provided. Jesus on the cross said it is finished. 
Oh my goodness. I don't believe most of us understand the gravity of that statement. Hanging between two three thieves, hoisted above the earth, with nails driven through the palms of his hands and through the nail through his feet, stripped naked before a Roman legion, laughing and mocking, looking like it is the worst of times, looking like everything he had ever had in terms of a dream and a vision had come to a grinding halt and everything about his future had crashed in that one moment. He looked around and said, I thirst. Even when he was hanging on the cross, he was still fulfilling scripture. And they give him vinegar and hyssop on a sponge. And he took it. And he looked around and declared, it is finished. It is finished. The assignment that he came, that was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. That a son is given and he shall be called wonderful, counselor, everlasting father, mighty God. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. The delivery of government back into this terrain had been completed. He was done. He had squared every single thing. He had crossed the T's and dotted the I's. He had fulfilled every letter and every prophecy in the Old Testament. In the volume of the book, he had come to fulfill the will of the Father. And the body that had been prepared. He had lived with it and prepared it as a sacrifice that once that body was broken, there was no longer need for sacrifices anymore for those who believed in him. And with his own blood, he went and sprinkled on the heavenly altar a blood that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Oh my goodness, I cannot delve fully into this. But I'm telling you, he said where there was no access, the day, the moment he said it is finished the cloth that separated the holy from the holy of holies was rent in two from the top to the bottom it came down separating and granting everyone access when jesus died and said it is finished you had access what did you have access to everything everything for it is the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom he has given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. Therefore, everything that you need to be able to live a victorious life, a conquering life, a triumphant life, everything that you need as a man or woman of God, as a child of God, you may be 12, you may be 72, you may be 55, you may be 25. Listen to me today. Everything that you need for a life of victory, taking over the territories that are of this world and making them the territories of our God. Everything that you need has been made available. Please be Berean, take time and go listen to this broadcast again. Take those scriptures, meditate on them until they percolate in your persona. Until you understand the abundance of access and the fullness of provision that the Father has made available through the Lord Jesus Christ. Number four, because a way has been made available for you to become a person whom life and history will have to contend to. This is the fourth reason why you should want to take over. A way has already been made. Imagine someone who is starving, is hungry. And then they are given the key to the supermarket. They are given the key to the store. And they are told, go in and take whatever you want. And they are given security to guard them. Would it be wise for such a person to sit down and bemoan their misfortune any further? When the door has been made open, when the way has been made pleasant, when the crooked places have been made straight, when he has caused the lines to fall for you upon pleasant places, when he has declared, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and therefore you do not have a reason to wonder, to be limited, to be ostracized, to be locked out. A way has been made available for you. He has gone before 
He has gone before and cleared the way for you to be a man that scripture would correctly refer to when it says that I and the children you have given me, we are for signs and wonders. You have been ordained to be a man or a woman for signs and wonders. That is what the prophets say. That is what scripture declared about you. Scripture is replete with truth that says who you are supposed to be. By the time you leave the world, by the time you exit the planet, People should not require the help of a tombstone to remember that you are here. Your exploits, your legacy, your significance, your impact on people, you should live on in the lives and the hearts of men and women across generations. It is possible. The way has been made available. The grace has been made available. The promises have been made not only available but have uh, executed, and how should I put them? They have been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. So that which was a promise strictly in the Old Testament is now a reality that you walk into according to New Testament realities and the new life, the new kingdom realities. What was just a promise for people to look forward to, to, to you, a child of the kingdom, is a truth that you walk into. It is a truth that when you become violent. You lay hold of it by force. That's what the scripture says when it says the kingdom of God from the days of John the Baptist until now. The kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent lay hold of it by force. They don't wait for the kingdom of God to fall like manna. No, no, no. They get up and they say, if God say that healing is mine, then I am going to get healed. I am not going to sit around and languish in the middle of my sickness. If I am not able to have faith for myself, scripture has made an avenue. It says, if two or three touch and agree concerning anything, I shall do it. It shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. If your faith is not sufficient by yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Listen, go, touch and agree with someone. One shall chase a thousand, two will put 10,000 to flight. God has made ways available. Are you broke? Are you in poverty? Is there a generational poverty trend that you seem to be tracking? The kingdom has wisdom for you to break the back of poverty. Not only from your life, from the, but from the rest of your genealogy. If you learn the full counsel of God, if you understand kingdom economics, that's why you need to get angry and get up. You need to arise from where you are because the way has been made available. What stopped you from I'm going into what you need to do. Listen to the utopian eunuch. Having listened to a man of God, he said, I see water here. What stopped me from being baptized? Can you at least be like the Ethiopian eunuch? And ask yourself, what stopped me from being delivered? What stopped me from arising? What stopped me from becoming the man or becoming the woman that God has called me to be? What stopped me from de demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit? What stopped me from producing and, and carrying the gifts of the Spirit? What stopped me from being a treasure in the kingdom of God? Oh my goodness, what stopped you this evening? Yet the way has been made available. The obstacles have been removed. A path has been cleared ahead of you. Don't let the enemy tell you you can't do it. The devil is a liar and when he lies, he speaks in his native tongue. But the truth came with Christ Jesus. The truth, the Bible says, the Holy Ghost will lead you into all truth. You will not have to reel to and fro wondering what is the truth. The Holy Ghost inside of you as a man of God, as a child of God, as a woman of God, as a daughter of the King. You have the Spirit of God who will lead you into all the truth. Don't let the enemy hold you down telling you there is no way out of this. The Lord has made a way. I wish you were listening to me today wherever you are. The Lord has made a way. The Lord has made a way. The Lord has made a way out of that temptation. The Lord has made a way out of that conflict. The Lord has made a way out of that struggle. The Lord has made a way out of that situation. Out of of that contention, out of that limitation. It doesn't matter what it is. The Lord has made a way. 
this evening. Arise, O mighty man of valor. Arise, O woman of God, and take your possession. Take your possession. Take your position. Lay hold of the kingdom. I wish someone right now listening to me, you may receive an impartation of a spirit of violence. I don't mean violence like rioting in the natural way. No, 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 no. I mean a spirit that is unstoppable. The, ri the roaring spirit, like that of the lion of the tribe of Judah that says, I know my God. I know him whom I have believed and I am I'm persuaded today, not tomorrow. I am persuaded right now, not yesterday. I am persuaded now that he is able to keep, not to let go, to keep, not to be defeated, to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I am confident. I am stable. I am grounded. I am anointed and appointed for this time and season. The way is clear. I am ready to go. The light has risen upon me. There is nothing that can hinder me. There is nothing that can stop me. That is the truth of your position. That is why you need to rise up. That is why you need to arise like a mighty man of valor and take over the land and take over the territory that God has appointed for you. I wish I could hear an amen or you could type an hallelujah or say something so that I know you're listening and that you're being blessed. Oh, glory to God. The fifth reason that I want to share with you on why you should take over is that you have an enemy who is committed to fight you. This is not a fight that is dependent on your reaction. The enemy is resolved and 100% committed to your downfall. It's not personal to what you have done. You represent everything that he hates. You represent everything that defeated him. You represent the one place that he can never ascribe and lay claim to. Scripture says, who is man that you are mindful of him? Who is man that you are mindful of him? My goodness. The only creature for whom God became incarnate and shed his blood and endured the shame of the cross. He never did it for any angel. He didn't do it for the devil. He did it for you. You are in an elevated position and the enemy cannot stand it. I can't tell you the number of reasons why your existence just irritates the enemy. Not your existence as a human being, but your existence as a New Testament creation. As a child of God, a completely new species that never existed. We are children who serve God. We are not just servants of God. We, serving is what we do, but children is who we are. He can never claim that. And the enemy is committed to fight you because he hopes that it is a proxy war. That by defeating you, he will defeat the plan of God. And you have an enemy that is committed whether you fight back or not. So let me ask you to have anointed common sense this evening. Did you hear what I say? I am calling you as a fellow human being, as a fellow child of God, as a fellow servant in the kingdom of God. Why should you allow the enemy to beat up on you without responding? Yet the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God. It's not that you are weaponless. So why should you sit there and have a pity party and say the enemy has routed you and nobody knows the trouble you've seen? That may be true, but after you have said that, God knows the trouble you've seen. Maybe human beings don't, but God knows he is touched by the feeling of your infirmity. Therefore, with the knowledge of the feeling of your infirmity, he says, arise. Because he knows your infirmity will not be reversed by you having a pity party. He knows your defeat will not be reversed by you sitting down and waiting for people to have mercy on you and to treat you like a charity case. Listen, God has ordained for you to fight back, to resist the devil. And the Bible says, if you resist him, he will flee. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. The enemy is ordained to be under your feet, not you under his feet. Because we have an enemy that is implacable. 
if you attempt to play by his rules, he will still oppress you. The children who are under the oppression of darkness are not having it easy. The Bible says, the way of the transgressor is hard. He says, the way of the transgressor is hard. The illusion of joy, the illusion of excitement is not the joy, it's not peace. Don't be hoodwinked. He's a merciless tyrant. So why allow a merciless, unemployed tyrant to terrorize you when God has equipped you to fight back? You need to rise up and take over because every other option is unacceptable. Being defeated when God has made everything available for you is unacceptable. God has not called you to be defeated. Before we finish, let me contextually give you three categories of events that require you to arise and take over. And, uh, and we will see how the Lord will, will lead us and guide us from there. Three areas. One, context or environments or situations that require you to arise and take over. Over time, we will go through and I will speak to you and uh, share with you uh, with the permission of uh, 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 LRM uh, Nairobi Church and our very gracious host, Pastor Carol Kariuki. Uh, as God enables that, we will be able to go through to understand the process of being raised. But for now, for now, the three environments, one is when a transition happens. Every generation has to pass a baton to the following. Even in the natural. Even in the natural, there is a generational baton that must be passed. From fathers to sons. From mothers to daughters. From one generation to another. Look at Acts chapter 13 verse 36. The Bible says, David served his own generation by the will of God. Once the fathers have served the, their generation by the will of God, the sons and daughters must arise to serve God in their own generation as well. This is a generation, generational thing. When ministers of the kingdom are promoted to glory, and the, the day I'm, live, I'm talking to you is, is so pertinent, we have seen major generals exit the scene. Mighty, mighty men of God, whether you like them or not, is immaterial. Over these past three or four years, right back to less than a month ago, from the levels of Miles Monroe to uh, whether you are looking at uh, uh, Maurice Rulo, the most recent one, and we have a raft of people in between, Billy Graham, name them, Reinhard Bonke, and those are the global level. At your, in your own country, in your own city, there are men of God who have passed on the mantle. They have gone on to glory. There is a call for men and women to rise up, stand up and be counted for such a time as this. There is a mantle to be picked. Joshua's need to arise when Moses exits the scene. Elisha's need to have walked with Elijah sufficiently that when Elisha is picked by the, the fiery chariots, they are not just like the sons of the prophet on the other side of the river, knowing everything about the season but doing nothing about it. They need to be Elisha's who have walked under these men and are in a position to pick up the mantle and go back to the same river, find the river that had been parted by their fathers, had resumed flowing and say, no, 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 the mantle has not yet left. Where is the God of Elijah? And the river opens up back again. That day the river opened twice. Once under Elisha, the other under Elijah, the second time under Elisha. We must raise a generation who will cause the river to open the second time so that there is a reconfirmation of the testimony that our God has not gone to sleep, that our God has not gone to slumber, that he is still alive and well, that he is still able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that men could ever ask or think. We must reestablish the covenants and the testimonies of God for our generation and the only way that will happen is when you arise, when transitions begin. The second thing is when maturity happens. First Corinthians chapter 13 verse 11. 
Paul writes and says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Listen, one of the ways we will understand that you have started growing and maturing. You are leaving the milk of the word. You are starting to deal with the meat of the word. You are ready to go into great things. Is when you start arising and taking over. When you realize that the house of God that you have been connected to is not a place that you go to be entertained or you go to be served. But rather it's a place that you go to serve. You go to deliver. When you develop the mindset of being a producer and not a consumer you walk in and you ask what can I do in this house so that the ministry of the king can be glorified when you go into an environment and you ask what can I do to bring the glory of the king into this environment can I pray can I lead worship can I serve can I wait on tables can I preach in the crusade is there something that I can do you need to open your mind open your eyes and realize that you don't show us that you have become a man and you have exited childhood just by the profundity and the multitude of scriptures that you're saying. No, no, no. We know that you have become a man when you put off the things of childhood. Not when you start seeing the things of adulthood, but when you put off. It is the exit from childishness where you need to be taken care of. Where you are an object of ministry rather than an avenue of ministry. When you get to that point, then we say maturity. We are having sons in the house. We are having daughters in the kingdom. And this maturity allows you to arise and to take over. Hallelujah. I tell you, maturing must precede arrival in the place of assignment. If you are a baby, even though you have a calling in your life, by the time the assignment is upon you, you will, you will falter and fail on the day of adversity, on the day that you, you need to be standing and counted among the righteous, among the saints, among the heroes of faith. What shall it be for you? Our time is running out in the next two minutes. Let me give you the last point. You need to arise and take over when destiny and purpose call. The king has always sought men and women who will go for him. Because he made this territory the domain of man. He made this fear the domain of man. And therefore, for his will to be done on this domain, men must go for him. Women must go for him. Young men must go for him. Young women must go for him. God will not come down and execute his own will on earth. He always has a need for men to go. Before Jesus ascended, he said, Therefore, go ye into all the world. The assignment, his last command, our first assignment, go ye into all the world. Second chronic, uh, Second Corinthians chapter five, verse. If you look at verse nineteen and twenty, Scripture talks about God has committed the assignment and the ministry of reconciliation to us, reconciling men back to God, and therefore we are ambassadors of God. Ambassadors are people who are sent to represent a dominion, a nation, a territory. They are not only sent, but they are representative. They don't go for themselves. They don't speak their own minds. They don't have their own agenda. They are driven by something bigger than them. And that thing is anchored in their home territory. When men and women realize we have a purpose, there is a destiny. There is a call upon us. We are not just enjoying the goodness and the miracles of God. There is a reason why we are here. And we are needed to go ye then we know we have men and women who are pursuing their call and we will have an arising and taking over that will happen. Jeremiah 29, 11. God talks, while he speaks in this particular context to people in captivity, the eternal truth here reflected is that God has a plan for us. Other scriptures, take time and go and read them. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, don't be conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may know the will of God. God has a will. And when you appropriate his will, 
you will find that arising is inevitable. First John chapter 3 verse 8, talking about that the, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he may destroy the works of the devil. Jesus himself came with a purpose and he said, as my father sent to me, so send I you. God is sending you with a purpose. You cannot execute your purpose if you don't arise and take over. Acts 26 verse 16 and Philippians chapter 3 verse 12. Please, this evening, we have just gotten started and I wish, I pray in my heart that you will take time to allow these truths to percolate in your spirit. There is a cause. There is a cause for you to arise. The avenue has been uh, arranged. There is a reason why you should want to take over. Next week, God granting, we will go into what we should be taking over. What is it we should be taking over? So that we don't run like blind men. We don't punch not knowing who our enemy is. And God will grant us grace. I believe you have been blessed wherever you are. Please, wherever you are right now, I don't want to close with a word of prayer. Wherever you are, bow your head. If you are physically need for healing for deliverance stretch your hand to the screen as i pray with you and god is able to reach you and to bless you and to minister to you heavenly father i join my faith today this evening with those that are listening to this broadcast father i lift my faith and join it with lfm nairobi church with Pastor Carol, with the saints and the leadership of that congregation, lifting this assembly of believers before you. Father, I speak life into each and every one. For those who had given up, for those who didn't seem to have a purpose, who didn't have a passion and a fire in their heart, I pray, Lord, strengthen them right now. Revive them. Let a wave of revival and renewal go through that entire assembly wherever they are in their homes. And those of the wider body of Christ watching from wherever you are, from Geneva, from the US, from the UK, from the broader Europe, from the rest of the country, from the rest of Kenya and Africa, from Australia, wherever you are watching this, I pray that let the Lord stir up a fire in you. Let there be a personal encounter that brings healing right now, that brings deliverance where the word of God was, the power of God was present to heal every one of them. I speak healing to your soul, to your body, to your spirit right now in the name of Jesus. Be loosed from every bondage of the enemy in Jesus' name. God bless you. It has been a pleasure to be with you. This is again Reverend Dr. Norbert Rakiro ministering to you at the welcome and the behest of our host pastor, Pastor Caroline Kuriuki. God bless you. I love you. Shalom.